Hey, hello everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, depending on your time zone. I'm so excited to have Ken today. We're going to talk about monkey tools. The, the, the name I like the most about the Excel and <laughs> about the data related things. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, uh, my name is Salil. I'm living in London, but originally from Turkey, Turkey. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you, Ken. We are all ears. Oh. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so welcome, everyone. We're going to be taking today a little bit of a look at how uh, monkey tools can help boost your Excel and possibly even Power BI efficiency if you're uh, if you're in that area. Um, I have got a little survey thing here that uh, if I've dropped the link into the chat, if you can fill that out, I'm going to hop over here um, just to get a quick idea here. We don't have a ton of people on uh, on the call here. Oh, so far I've got one vote. All right. Hopefully I can get a couple more than that. Um, so let me just copy that uh, that link back into the chat just in case anybody missed it. Go to menti.com and enter this code. Um, this is a three question survey. The first question really is around what app is your sort of default if you're going to uh, to dive into business intelligence um, reporting it at all. And uh, I'm always curious to see how this works, whether people are Excel first or Power BI first. Maybe I'll let you guys come back and uh, and have a little bit more of a, a look at this one because um, one vote isn't uh, obviously, oh, we've got two now. There we go. Okay, we've got a Power BI person. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> it's, it's all good. Uh, I'm always curious to see how many people are Excel first. I'm very much an Excel first guy, but it does depend on the task. So that's, uh, that's kind of the reason I ask. Um, so let me uh, let me slide that aside here. If we get more votes, I'll come back and take a look at that. I'm going to talk a little bit. Just uh, I'll run through really quickly on who I am. Um, I am actually a fully certified accountant from Canada. Um, I run a website called excelguru.ca, which has a blog and a forum, some help articles, things like that. Um, I'm also one of the founding partners behind a company called Skillwave Training, where uh, myself and my partner, Matt Ellington, try to deliver the best training you can get on uh, Power Query, Excel, Power BI, Power Pivot, all those kind of data modeling tools that we use in modern business intelligence reporting. Um, I am a Microsoft MVP, have been since 2006. Um, it's been quite a while. I've been stepping uh, back and forth across different categories in the Excel uh, and data platform areas. So those are the categories that looked after both Excel, obviously, and Power BI. I um, was a Power BI MVP for uh, about three years. Um, I'm now back in what's called the M365 Office Apps and Services, which is the category that looks after Excel again, because that really is sort of my home and, and uh, living place in the tools that I use. Um, I am a software developer. I'm an author. Obviously, we're subject today is Monkey Tools. This is the software that I write and distribute. And I've written a couple of books. Um, probably one of the uh, the cult famous ones is uh, M is for Data Monkey. The up to date, more uh, refined version of that is Master Your Data. This is a, a book that is about 50% bigger than the previous one and is updated. So if you are looking to pick up one of these books, you definitely want to grab Master Your Data, um, unless you want to have just the uh, you know the cult classic following on your bookshelf. I mean, you can certainly still find Amos for Data Monkey out there. Um, I want to talk a little bit about my modeling philosophy before I dive in here and talk about my tool because I actually do work in both Excel and Power BI. Um, but every model that I start actually starts in Excel. No matter what I'm going to be doing, I generally start in Excel first. I will build the model using Power Query, Power Pivot. I'll go and explore my data, make sure that everything's set up the way I want. And then if I need to take it into Power BI for any reason, I will actually do that. But oftentimes I don't. I'll just publish straight from Excel into Power BI because we can actually use Excel as your Power BI desktop platform to do this. Once we've got that, we can then build more reports online. So this really sets it up as a thin and core approach to, uh, to working with your data. And then we can obviously distribute to people. If there are features that I need that only exist in Power BI Desktop, things like row level security, or I'm looking for specific visuals that I need to be able to do in the desktop canvas, I can always import to Power BI Desktop, build my reports, and then of course publish the Power BI Desktop file to Power BI. So I have different options here, but like I say, a lot of the models that I build never actually ever see Power BI Desktop at all. And this is one of the reasons why I built my tool here is to try and actually accelerate that process of modeling to make it a little bit easier to go. But I'm trying to follow all of the recommended or best practices around data modeling that you would actually do inside Power BI. So let's talk a little bit about monkey tools here. Um, and this particular software, the target audience primarily 
is for people that work like I do, Excel users that are building models using Power Query and Power Pivot, or people who actually get models from other people that they need to audit. That's my sort of primary focus of where I started. It does have some functionality for Power BI users, but primarily this is an Excel focused tool. My software philosophy, and this is really important, I follow a do no harm philosophy. I do not do stuff in your software unless you specifically ask us to do this. Uh, we have one installer, one version. It installs without admin rights. We, we have a free and a pro version for, for our software. We deliver a high proportion of useful free features, but then for pro users who are willing to actually pay us a license fee, we actually make things even easier and provide more use cases. So it's a freemium product if you like. Can, can I also we, learned from- Sorry to interrupt. Yep. Can we have a, a trial version for our audience? I'll get there, but yes, you absolutely can. Um, <laughs> so we, we also uh, learn from user choices as we go along here. This is one of the things that drives me crazy with software is when you have to keep on say, making the same default choices every time you use it. So we try to actually cache those. And the other thing that I want to just call out that's super important because I get asked this all the time is, Ken, what if I use your tool and I go and build a model and I send it to somebody else and they don't have monkey tools installed? Will it work? And the answer is 100%, it will just work. I am not one of those people that wants to try and have my software proliferate through your organization. Anything you build with monkey tools will use or will work on any machine that has never seen monkey tools installed ever. Okay. This is a really important thing. We do not believe in license lock-in. So let's talk about licensing because this of course is the big elephant in the room always. We install on a named user basis. Uh, every named user can install their license on up to three computers. Um, I don't know about you, but I've got a desktop in my office. I've got a laptop that I carry around with me. And every now and then I might go to a client site where I need to install my software in order to work on something. So we believe that three computers is the right, uh, right sort of um, piece on that one there. Our pricing model goes like this. We have a forever free community version. I'm an MVP that comes from supporting the community. So I have a version of my software that actually has a lot of features in it that is completely free. As I say, we've got one installer. When you install it, you get the free version immediately. You can sign up for a trial of your pro license. You get two works, weeks. Once it's done, it reverts back to the free license. It's not going to charge you. I do not love companies that give you a two-week trial and then start charging you right away. That sucks. So we actually fall back to the free version. And if you want the pro features, you can opt in for the pro license subscription. Um, you can also opt in and opt out whenever you like. This is up to you to manage. If you want to go pro for a month and then opt out of your pro, whatever, go do it. I don't care. At the end of the day, my philosophy is that I'm trying to put something out there so that the people that need the software can pay for it when they need it and they don't have to when they don't. And I feel it's my job to try and give you enough features in the pro version to convince you that you really want to keep that license going indefinitely. Full details on pricing um, can be found at monkeytools.ca. We have our own website here. You'll notice it. It's got my beautiful cyber monkey on there when you get there. And that is basically the licensing model we have behind this. Now, a couple of things I just want to call out here. You'll notice the icons, the green check marks, and the yellow little certificate there. Those are going to appear on my slides as I go through because they will help indicate what the pricing levels of the features that I'm going to be showing you are. And I'll try and call that out as I go along. So, Let's look at some of the many Monkey Tools features. I'm not going to show you everything today. We only have an hour, so I can't possibly do it. But what happens when you install Monkey Tools is you get a new ribbon inside Excel, and it looks like this. This is the Monkey Tools ribbon. It is divided into two general categories of buttons. We have what we call convenience features. You can look at these as buttons that Ken stole from other ribbon tabs and put them on one tab so I don't have to flip back and forth as much. Okay, so these are default native Excel uh, feature sets that you actually have behind these buttons. Everything else is a monkey tools feature that I have specifically written and coded to do specific things. Within these categories of monkey tools features, they are divided into two categories of their own. We have things called monkeys and we have things called sleuths. The sleuths investigate things around your workbook. So they're the sleuth being the great detective like Sherlock Holmes is there to try and analyze and figure out what's happening. The monkeys take action and do stuff, right? When you want things to happen, you call in an army of monkeys to get them to work, okay? So there we go. That is the sort of philosophy that I have behind the software. And now we're gonna start looking at how things work. This first feature that I'm gonna show you here is installed immediately <clears throat> with Monkey Tools. It works in a free license, absolutely 100% fidelity, no issues at all. And uh, this is something that I believe should is the way that Microsoft should have released tables in Excel. 
We have what we've called the from table or range monkey. This is the one feature that we have that actually replaces Excel's default um, experience. If you press control T or control L or go to get data from table, in Excel, what normally happens, you get prompted with a dialogue that gives you the range. So then you define the range, you pull it into Power Query, you make a query, you land it to a table, and then you go back to Excel and you change the table name to something sensible and your queries blow up. Well, we said this is ridiculous. What we want to do is we want to allow you to define the name of your tables, named ranges, or dynamic arrays up front so that when you pull them into Power Query, they just work and you don't have to rename them later. Uh, we also give you the ability to create an optional connection only query during creation. Um, and again, the whole point of this is to name items before you create your queries to future proof it so that they don't blow up in future. Fully functional and a free license. And it also has configurable defaults because maybe in certain cases you do want Excel's behavior. I don't know why you would. I never do, but I've been asked. So we gave you the ability to actually chain that on. And also to turn on connection only query by default. There's also the ability to define custom prefaces. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to hop over into Excel. I'll show you here. I have some tabular data. I've got four sets of tabular data, five sets of tabular data. This is an actual uh, set of data. So is this, so is this. This is a dynamic array. You can see that it's referring to M7 to 011 and it's spilling into this area here. This is also another dynamic array. So here's the deal. Normally, when you go to format as table, what you get is you get this dialog. And then as I say, the problem is it will create a table called table one. You'll then pull that into Power Query, make some changes, land it to a worksheet. And then when you come back, and I'm just gonna do this real quick, and then you change this name up here, everything blows up. So let me just control Z and undo that. And I'll show you what happens when you use monkey tools for this. I'm gonna go control T. And it comes up and you'll notice it says, hey, this is table one. And it's all highlighted here. Right away, I can go and say, this is my data one. I can give it a name. I don't even need to select it. It's pre-highlighted, so you can just type it. We pick up that the data is in your table. We pick up that it has headers. And we give the ability to create a connection-only query by default. I'm not going to do that right now. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to say OK. And you can see we create a table. And it is called my data one. If I now go and pull that into Power Query, it is just going to work. Alternately, I can do this, right click, get data from table or range. In the normal world of things in Excel, it would actually go and create your table called table one, pull it into Power Query, and this is where the problem starts. So for me, I'm gonna call this my data two. It has, my data has headers. It doesn't give me the option to create a connection only query because when I click okay, it's gonna launch me into Power Query so that I can actually go and do my thing. Okay, so now I can go in and set things up. And you'll notice the source of this is the newly named table that I provided, not table one that's going to blow things up in future. Okay, so I'm just going to close and load on that one. We'll load it to connection only. This tabular data has no headers. Um, this is a little bit different than what you see with, uh, with Excel because in Excel, if you have data that does not have headers here, it will not check this box for you. Okay, if it thinks that everything is text, it says, oh, well, I'm sorry, if it has everything as text, it won't check the box. We believe that 99% of data actually has headers. And if it doesn't, you can turn it off. Okay, so I'm going to turn this one off and it'll then inject column headers for me. I'm also going to ask in this one to create a connection only query. And what you'll see is that it goes through, it creates the table. And for my data three, the name of this table, it's already created a connection only query for me right away. The majority of time when I'm pulling data into tables today, the reason being is because I need to create a connection only query to do something else with it. So why not have this as part of the native table setup, I guess is basically what I'm saying. The only thing is it can take a little bit of time, which is why we make that an optional default. Now, what about named or dynamic arrays? Um, Excel does support getting data from dynamic arrays if you're on Office 365. So here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and say, get data from table arrange. And you'll notice that this one comes up and says, oh, it's not a table, you must want a named range. We've called it ARY for array because we have identified that it is an array. Here is the range of data for your array. What would you like? You can define the scope differently if you want to. I'm gonna go and call this one ARY1. And when I go and say, okay. Oh, nice, I love it when that happens. What, where did my Excel go? Always good when I get a bug in the middle of a live demo, fantastic. Why did that happen? Do, 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 get data from table range, ARY1. What did I do differently? All right, apparently I've got a bug I got to go fix. This was working last week. So let's try ARY. 
Ah, doesn't like ARY1 for some reason. Cool. I will make a quick note of that. ARY1. All right. So this will now pull it in with the named array of ARAY because that's what I typed in this time. Um, something else, though, that is important around this is that we also support the ability to customize this a little bit. So under my options monkey over here, options monkey, he's a monkey, he does things. Under global options, we can use the default from table range experience, the default insert table button, control T, control L. You can include your query by default, or in the case of a dynamic array, maybe I wanna call this one uh, DN or DNY ARY for my preface here. If I go and define this and say close, what will happen is when I now go and get data from my dynamic array, you'll notice that it prefaces it with what my preface was that I declared. Not only that, we don't select the entire thing. We put the cursor at the end because we know you want this as a preface. So you can now go and call it whatever you like. Okay, so there's data. We'll say, okay, and this one brings us in. I wonder why my ARY1 name didn't work. I'm definitely going to look at that. But there you go. So this is, this is the from table or range monkey. And I'm just going to go and set this back to my defaults. I want to get rid of that because I like the preface I have. Um, but I like this because it makes life a little bit easier. It gets into the experience that I think the Excel team should have had. Uh, this is a feature that I actually released back in April after I was at an MVP summit complaining to the Excel team, why can't we name our tables up front? And they gave me all kinds of reasons why they didn't want to do it. So I said, the heck with it. I'm tired of waiting. I've been waiting for 10 years. So I wrote the feature myself. So there we go. It is the one feature inside Excel that actually overrides Excel's behavior which is why we have those abilities in the options monkey to turn them off, okay? So there you go, there's the first demo, the from table or range monkey. It's a quality of life improvement really, make life a little bit easier for you. And again, it is completely functional in a free license. Uh, another big feature that I have, I'm all about, um, I'm all about being lazy. I mean, efficient, uh, trying to do things in the most efficient manner so I don't have to spend a lot of time doing clicks and all the rest of it. So we invented this thing called the Biblio Monkey. And what the Biblio Monkey is, is it essentially provides you a library to store your own queries, measures, formulas, lambdas, VBA, Office scripts, Python formulas, whatever you like. Um, we have a library here which will allow you to actually store these things in it. So I have run into a lot of people who have big formula patterns that they use for like, you know, their DAX formulas, and they store them in Notepad. And every time they need them, they open Notepad, they copy it, they paste it into their workbook and make their adjustments. And I said, you know, that's awesome, but wouldn't it be easier if you had a database that was available right inside Excel and you could tag these things so that when you go to insert it, it prompted you for what changes need to be made. If you store this database in a OneDrive sync folder, it actually works across multiple machines. And this is actually what I do with mine is it's stored in my, um, in my documents folder that syncs across multiple computers. You can then insert things into your other workbooks on demand. Uh, items with variable tags prompt you and we have contextual tags for different things. So your DAX prompts are gonna be different than your query prompts, different than your formula prompts and so forth. And uh, the other thing to note on this one, the behavior of copy versus just inject it directly into your workbook is based on the item and the license type. So what does that actually mean? I will hop in and I will show you. So, so here is a, um, a setup that I actually have for, uh, for one, of my, um, one of my things here. And you'll notice that I've got a bunch of divide by zero errors in this. Um, these drive me crazy. And the reason being is because this formula here is attempting to divide um, R7 by the um, value in this area, which is dividing by zero and therefore it is failing. Now, the correct thing to do in this case is to go and wrap this in a statement to check if there is an error there so we don't put something out. Now I could do this by writing an if error function. And normally what you might do is you might say, hey, I'm gonna go and write all of these ones here. I'll wrap it in if error, except if you're watching very carefully, you'd see that the formula changed. I go back to this one here. This is a rounding formula. This one here is a subtotal formula. Uh, let me see, there was another one I saw that actually had, oh yeah, this is just a, a quick subtraction. So I have a whole bunch of these guys to do. So wouldn't it be nice if we could go and grab all of these data points and just go right click and say, insert from BiblioMonkey formula, error handlers, and wrap it all in if error comma zero. And, Lord, 
I love it when this kind of stuff happens. <laughs> You're just laughing, right? Obviously, I didn't pray to the demo gods today. <laughs> this is so killing me. What is going on? Um, you know, this has worked for ages. If you watch any other video, it's going to work on this one. Fantastic. What did I do? Let me just check the formula real quick and make sure that it's actually working the way it's supposed to. So here we go. Error handlers, if error zero. So contents, that one is doing what it's supposed to do. So what is going on? All right. Well, let me see if I can wrap it in a different one. Uh, do, 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 do. If it's just an issue with that particular formula, if error blank, nope, it's going to fail on it. Just no reference. Okay. Are not with us today. Yeah, apparently, uh, apparently so. So um, there we go. I'm just trying to think if uh, no, the build should be fine. Uh, at any rate, what is what is supposed to happen with this one, and what will be happening as soon as I get the chance to go and debug it is this: the error handling function for if error zero looks like this. Okay, so if I go and just sort of open this up here, um, I'm going to show you how I actually build these things. So normally, what you would do is you'd build a function that looks like this: if error a one comma zero. And then what I basically did is I said, okay, instead of A1, I want to have this prompt me. So I'm gonna right click on this, add new prompt. And it says, here is a list of all of the different prompts that you might have that you might want here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in cell contents and it tags it with cell contents. So that when I go and call this back, providing that all my error handlers are working correctly in my own software, what will happen is it just replaces whatever that reference is with the actual formula reference itself. And that should land in the cell here, no problem. I'm going to find out really quickly here if my next one works because I have another function that I want to use here. Uh, what I'm looking to do is write a formula here to get the end of the month from the cell to the left. So we're going to go with our insert from BiblioMonkey formula and I'm going to grab end of next month relative. This pops up and says, all right, what cells do you want to apply it to? It's going to pick up my selection. What's the base month? I'm going to go and grab this guy here. And how many months would you like to change it? We're going to say one. And there we go. So what's going on with my if error? That's weird. Um, and away it goes. You can actually notice here that this has now replaced it. It's looking at the cell to the left. It's looking at the cell to the left, okay? How I built this one, if I go and take a look at the actual formula for my end of next month relative, I've put in two things here. The CRR is when I tag this, I said I want a cell reference that is fully relative. And then I used a value prompt for number of months. Okay, and it will actually go back and contextually replace these components. I have another formula that I use for this particular thing. So basically what I'm building here is something that's a very common format that I use when I'm doing forecasts. Uh, what I have is I have my units sold from the prior year and I want to increase it by 5% globally, but I want an override that I can increase certain ones by different amounts. So this is a, a bit of a complex formula to write. It's not, it's not a bad once you know how it works, but I don't want to have to write this every time and I'll show you why. So I'm going to go insert formula. I'm going to insert my volume forecast with override. It's a formula that I know how it works. It's an important component here. What's the part that I want to apply it to? Notice my global increase is asking me for a fully, um, a fully absolute reference. I'm going to go and grab this one here. The monthly override is going to be this one and the monthly volume fully relative. So you can see that it's tagging fully absolute, fully relative based on the tags that I chose. And when I go and inject this function, the formula that is being written is this. So you can see why I don't want to write this every single time. And this is the part of the strength of BiblioMonkey that makes it so useful is that you look at that and you go, Ken, I would never know how to write that formula. Well, that's okay. You don't need to. The reality is that every formula that you build, I'm going to copy that. I'm going to go into BiblioMonkey, and when I go and say add new and choose to add a new formula, the way you build this is you say, this is my formula. You'll paste the, the thing in here, and then you basically go through and say, okay, well, this one here needs to be an absolute reference. Right click. Let's go with, holy cow, there's a whole bunch of these guys. Um, and I see I've got another bug that i got to work through, but this is going to be a cell reference fully absolute. So this is going to be my global uh, barrier or factor, whatever I want to call it, give it a name and it will actually tag this in place. Once you've got it, you click save. Then when you go to inject it, it's just going to work for you. Now, the nice thing about this, every single thing that gets in stored inside this database, you know how it works because you wrote it in the first place. I don't put things in here for you. This is your job is to figure out how do I populate with things that actually matter to me. 
Okay, so it's a really, really cool, uh, cool little function set. Um, I think that'll really help people uh, go and actually build, build things faster because it allows you to capture the things you use the most. Uh, as far as injection factors, I mentioned that some of this works under a free license, some of it works under a pro license. Here is the, the deal that we want to know about this. The right-click insert from BiblioMonkey, formulas, Lambda, and Python formulas, all will work on any license. You can import right from here. Lambda function, by the way. I've got a Lambda function for worksheet name. I can insert my Lambda function and say equals L underscore worksheet name. Oops, got to give it a cell reference, Ken. That's important, A1. And there we go. It actually gives me the, the worksheet itself. The things that don't, or the, where the license cost comes in is when you want to do something like this. I've got a query over here for reading from a SQL database. This is all hard coded. I'm gonna go and inject. On a free license, this will say copy. You'll need to copy all this and make your own query. On a pro license, we can inject this and it will now go and inject the query right into my workbook. Okay, so we'll just wait for that to finish. And here we go, it's gonna to load to the data model. Do, 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 do. This is pulling from uh, a, an Azure database, so it's just gonna take a couple seconds to finish. And there we go, 15 rows loaded. But where this gets really neat again is that this works for 2009 and a specific restaurant location. Let me grab that. I'm going to go to this version, control A, and just update that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's go right click and say value, enter a year. And then we'll go and we'll grab this one here and say, Right click, add new prompt. We're going to go with text, enter a location. Just going to update this. And now, so this is the same query you just saw here. I'm going to prompt this one and it's going to say, where would you like it to go? Let's load it to the data model. We're going to go with the year being 2013. And uh, I'm going to go with the location, which is called Tax Evader, which is inside this database. And when I now go and inject, I now have my annual location sales summary, which is the name that I stored it in here, which I had the ability to, uh, to override. And then, interesting. Um, I'm gonna go back and take a look and here we go. There's a 2013 for Tax Evader. So it's prompted and made those changes inside the, uh, the M code that goes in and in place. So you have no idea how much I wish I could offer this in Power BI, but unfortunately you can't because the APIs are not there. So, so we support contextual tagging for things. Uh, like I say, for queries, we've got text values and queries. If we're getting into uh, to DAX measures, uh, I just recently, as in like earlier, well, two days ago, released a new functionality in this that when you go and you tag for DAX measures, we've expanded the tag so you can actually classify any table or specifically just dimensions, just calendar tables, disconnected or measure tables, primary foreign or non-key columns or any column, calendar columns, because those are really column, or even unqualified columns as well. I don't like this one because it gives you a massive list of every column in your data model, but you have the ability to really tag these things granularly as to exactly what you're actually looking for, which is pretty cool. So um, so there you go. Um, it's kind of some cool, uh, cool pieces there. Uh, again, the measures and queries will only go and inject into your workbook if you are um, if you're working on uh, on a pro license. Uh, Uxel, I see the uh, the comment or the the um, item that you've dropped into the menu. I can see your Python uh, menu is uh, is blank. I'm assuming you haven't stored any Python formulas in there, and that's why that's showing up as empty. But I could probably do better in that regard and say, hey, um, you know, say there's no formulas here or something like that, or even hide it altogether. But but uh, I will take that on uh, on notice as well. Unless there's another comment, just throw it into the chat and let me know. Anyway, so this is BiblioMonkey. It's intended there to allow you to store things and call them back later on and make your life a little bit easier. Okay. So um, <clears throat> another thing I want to show you, uh, a real pain point as far as Excel goes is broken folder paths when you're, you're grabbing data from file or from folder. Um, this one drives me a little bit crazy as well. Um, and uh, basically what I've got is I've got two monkeys to help out in this. I've got something called Smart File and Smart Folder. Um, these have existed in quite a while for monkey tools, but I actually did some upgrades to them earlier in the year. Uh, the functions themselves, FN Smart File and FN Smart Folder can be injected into any workbook for free. If you want to use the monkey that actually hooks up all of the stuff for you so that you don't have to do the manual work, that is a pro feature. 
So the monkeys actually hook everything together for you, including injecting a parameter table and query, inserting the smart file, smart folder query, and avoiding formula firewall errors. Now, on that note, there is documentation at monkeytools.ca that will tell you how to do all this for free. So you don't have to have a pro license to get the functionality. It just is a lot easier for pro users. So what I'm gonna do at this point here is I'm gonna go and open a new Excel workbook. So let me just go and open a brand new Excel workbook here. I'm gonna do a save as, and I'm just gonna save this over top of one of the files that I have in my demo folder, which is called uh, Smart Paths. There we go. I'll say save, here we are. Awesome. And um, what I'm gonna do at this point is I'm now gonna go and build myself a, um, a new uh, parameter table and function. So to do this, I'm gonna go and say query monkeys, and I'm gonna inject a parameter table and function into my workbook, okay? So notice I did ask for this, it pops these things in and away we go. It's injected this fn get parameter function and this table. Now, by default, what this does is it puts in a couple of formulas to return the file path for where this workbook is saved, the folder path for where it's saved and a file name for the file that we're actually working with. This is one of the reasons why this one needs to be saved. I'm gonna go and change the name of the file, which is build better dash begin. This is a specific file that I'm gonna work with. And I'm gonna update the file path to say equals this and build better. Okay, so I'm now using the default function to go and grab my folder path, but I've built my own custom file path for the file that I'm looking to target. And what I'm now gonna do is I'm gonna go to query monkeys and I'm gonna choose to use my smart file monkey to connect to this file. So here we go, smart file monkey pops up and says, hey, what would you like to call it? And I think I'm gonna go and call this one. Um, let me see, what can I call this one? Let's call it build better. That just sounds like a nice name. And it says, which variable holds the file path? If it finds file path, it'll use that. Otherwise you can choose from a drop down list. And when I say, okay, it comes back and it gives me an exclamation mark after injecting a new file. The reason being is because it's looking for this file on SharePoint and naturally we've got to define our data privacy. It's going to be organizational. I probably have to log in even though I'm logged in already. That drives me nuts. I wish it would do better than that. Oh, no, it don't. There we go, cool. And now I can drill into this categories table. There we go. So this is my build better details. I'm going to say close and load, and I'm just going to go and reload this one here. Load it to a table. We'll just drop it right over here. Okay, so <laughs> this is pulling for the Excel file that's stored on SharePoint using this particular file path. Okay, so that's the first part to be aware of. I'm also going to go through and do a couple of other things here. I'm gonna go and inject a smart folder monkey. This one says, where do you store this particular one? What would you like to call it? So I'm gonna call this one here. Um, I'm gonna call it folder.files, okay? Which variable holds the file path? Well, that's gonna be the folder path here, okay? And do you wanna see your, your files and subfolders? I'm gonna say okay to this. This injects a new function and it gives me this folder.files, which if I go and take a look at it here, what the important part that I want you to notice about this is that this is giving us the default from folder experience that you get when you connect to a folder inside Power Query, meaning it gives you a listing of all of the different files that are actually in here. We do a couple of things differently though. Number one, we strip the folder path off. When you've got a massive HTTPS path, it's so hard to see things. So we actually remove that so you can see what's actually in the subfolders. We also make the slashes a consistent direction. This is gonna become important in just a second here. And we force your extensions to lowercase. I'm just gonna go and filter this one here for .xlsx. Oops, that's not how you spell xlsx, Ken. There we go, that's better. So we'll get just our xlsx files. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go close and load and I'm gonna load this to a table on my worksheet here. Do, 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 table and we'll drop it right over here. Okay, so this guy, when it goes through is now gonna list me all my files. Now, obviously I'm never gonna do this. This is not the point of it. Like the point of it really is to say, hey, I can connect to this so I can you know, drill down into my files a little bit more, but I wanna show you another alternative because this is the default experience you get with from folder or from SharePoint with a couple of modifications. I'm gonna show you another monkey here, smart folder monkey again, but this one is gonna be 
folder.contents. And we're not going to show the files in the subfolders. And when we do this, what we get is a much shorter table of data. The reason being is I'm going specifically to that folder and I'm not enumerating files in subfolders. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to do a filter down here. We're going to filter down to just XLSX files. But if you've ever worked with folder.contents, you'll know that it gives you, actually, let me just show this first. These are all the subfolders that are in that folder, but not all the files that live inside those subfolders. Okay. The dot files method, which is default, gives you practices recursion and looks at everything below, where this one here looks at just that folder. It's a lot faster. So this is kind of cool. Let's go filter this again down to just XLSX. Awesome. I'm going to hit close and load, and I'm going to load this one off beside it. Now, right off the bat, I find this a lot easier to use the smart monkeys to grab this stuff because it opens things up and it actually makes sure that everything is going to work. It strips those folder paths off. It makes my file extensions consistent casing, which is really, really good for actually going and building things in future. But let me show you the real reason why I do this. I'm going to hit save. I'm going to close Excel. And I'm going to pause syncing on OneDrive. Now, why did I do that? Well, because when I now go and open this file, let me just double click on Smart Pass and open it up again. Okay, so. This is the original file, but what you'll notice is that the file path is completely changed. It is now a C colon backslash file path. Now, this obviously is a big issue because not only did the file path change, which will usually blow up Power Query, it changed from SharePoint hosted to local hosted, which will also blow up Power Query because they need different connectors. And what I'm going to do at this point is I'm now going to go and say, Let's do a refresh all. And by the way, I use the monkey tools tab to do this, but the data refresh all is going to do exactly the same thing. But what you'll notice about this is that when it refreshes, I got a new file here. You will never see this come from SharePoint because it's got the tilde dollar sign on it. That indicates that it's a temp file. It showed up in both places. The important thing to recognize here is even though I switched both the location from SharePoint to local and the file path changed, everything here refreshed. Let me do this under the standard data refresh all button. You can see they're all loading and everything just works. Okay. So we now have a portable file solution for reference. FN smart file, FN smart folder will work in Power BI. The dynamics of this though will not. Okay. So something to, uh, to keep in mind on that. That's an Excel thing, but this makes it, your file solutions a lot more portable. It's based on something that I built years ago for being able to develop solutions locally for, uh, for my, um, for my computer uh, or build things locally for my clients and then ship them to them so that everything still worked uh, in the grand scheme of things uh, without having to get in and, and edit um, queries and things like that. So, so there you go. There is uh, that is the smart folder and smart file monkeys. Uh, as I mentioned, as far as the free side of things go, everything above the line here, injecting your parameter table and function to get parameters for Power Query, which is based on the concepts in uh, in this book here um, around chapter 17. That's just automating that process. Everything above this dividing line here can be injected for free. Actually, the create query from M code can as well. Everything from smart file monkey down is a pro feature. Having said that, if you go to monkeytools.ca, there is full documentation on how to inject all of this stuff without actually using the pro features. You just need to spend the time doing it yourself. If your time is valuable, consider a pro license instead. Um, all right. So there we go. That's uh, that is our smart uh, smart monkeys there. And let me go and talk now. I'm going to take us into a data modeling demo. So I do a lot of data modeling inside uh, inside Excel. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a bunch of different features here. We're going to look at query monkeys, measure monkeys, biblio monkey, uh, and then we're going to examine the model using query sleuth, DAX sleuth, and model sleuth. Some of the other features that uh, that we have for actually taking a look at what's going on. So uh, for this one here, let me go and open up a little file here, which is called Build Better. Oops, hang on a second. That's not the right one. Kill it. There we go. This is the one I'm after. Build Better dash begin. And <laughs> what I'm looking for is to create an output kind of like this, okay? Um, something that's important to recognize here is I use a non-standard year-end. My year-end starts in October, 
it does not start in January. What do I have? I have some data here. I've got sales data, budget data, categories. I do not have any calendar data. Now I need to pull these three data tables into Power Query. And what you'll notice is that right now, there are no Power Queries inside the file. So I'm going to use our Table Monkey. And Table Monkey goes through and says, All right, I have located that you have three tables inside your workbook. We also do look for named ranges, by the way. We've got the categories table, and here's what gets cool with this, right? So if I click on categories, it will select the table. If I click on sales, it'll select the table. And then I look at this one and go, table one, what's that? I click on, oh, that's budget. I don't love that name. So I'm gonna right click on this and I'm gonna rename this to budgets. It now renames the table in the workbook as well. So I can start cleaning up some of the, the mistakes that have been made behind the scenes. We have the ability in here. What's going to happen by default is this follows my um, my staging method that I use, which basically is raw data source, an extract query, a transform query, and then a load query that goes to the actual data model itself. Okay, um, so I always go with raw data staging and then categories. We can change the custom prefaces here. You can disable tables if you don't want them to load. You can decrease the number of staging levels or increase them if you prefer to do so. You can say, hey, I don't want this one to load to the data model, create make connection only query. You've got options in here to play around with this as well as a few other things, but I'm just gonna go and create this and I'll watch you watch what happens down the right-hand side here. Normally what I have to do if I'm doing this stuff manually, which I just don't anymore, is I have to right click on the table, pull it into Power Query, right click and reference it, right click and reference it, load them all as connection only query, and then change this one to load to the data model. There is no way that I can do nine of those queries in seven seconds. Our, there are monkeys are, are very, very fast that direction. Okay, so there we go. We've now got our three tables loaded to the data model. Let's just check that. We'll hop into Power Pivot, go into diagram view. Here we are. We've got sales, we got budgets, we got a categories table. I wish I could, uh, well, I've, I've thought about building a relationship engine, but that's kind of hard, so I'm not going to do that, but there we go. So I've got these guys set up. The next thing I'm going to need at this point in time is I'm going to need a calendar table. I don't have one of those, so rather than go through the painful process of actually building one, I have a calendar monkey. The calendar monkey hops in, he takes a look at the details of what's actually going on inside the file, and it says, cool, what kind of calendar do you like? Do you want a 12 month? Do you want a 445, 454, 544, 13 month? I'm gonna go with 12, but I don't like the year end. Now my data goes from 2013 to 2018, I think. So I'm just gonna go and pick a year end of September 30th, and notice I'm using 2023. Okay, that's okay. It doesn't matter. We're just looking for a valid year end. It doesn't have to be inside your data. The next thing I need to do is define a starting date. I'm going to grab this from staging sales. I'm going to use the date column. My ending date is going to come from my staging budgets table. I'm looking for a table that will have the earliest possible ever date and the latest possible ever date. I'm going to load it to the data model, give it a name. You can create multiple calendars through this as long as they have unique names. I'm then going to say next. And it says, cool, which columns would you like? You just go and check the boxes, okay? So there we go. I'm then gonna say, next. we actually, we learned from these defaults too, by the way. Uh, I'm gonna say next on this one here, and I'm gonna add relationships to the budget and sales date. If I had chosen the same tables here, if I'd actually chosen these tables, it would automatically check those boxes for me because I chose different tables it doesn't know. So at this point in time, we say create, and you can watch as it goes through, it's gonna create a specific start date query and end date query, and then load all 1,096 rows to the calendar. And then it gives you some information down the bottom for the things that I cannot do. Unfortunately, I can't do this. There's no API that allows me to, okay? Oh, look, there's my calendar table, all linked in nicely. So that's beautiful, but I can't do this. And I wish I could. I can't hide the foreign keys. You should always do that. Hide the field on the many side of the relationship. As a matter of fact, I'm also going to go and hide these guys. I also can't do this, which drives me absolutely batty. Month, sort by column, sort by uh, where is my month of fiscal year. I can't set up sorting hierarchies. I am desperate to be able to set up sorting hierarchies, and I'm asking the Excel team to please give us that. But it has been years six, no, 14 years. So I don't see that coming anytime soon. Anyhow, at this point, I've set up the sorting keys on the back end now. So um, at this point, I could start building my pivot tables, but I need one more thing. 
I need measures. Now, I do not love implicit measures. I think that when you create an implicit measure, just drag a field into a pivot table. By default, they should actually give you an explicit measure to encourage reuse. So we created a couple of measure monkeys here. And this is really targeted, the basic explicit measures is targeted at people that don't know any DAX, okay? So if I go to the budget table and I say, look, I want the amount column, you'll notice it says, look, we're gonna sum it. Here's the DAX signature for you. And we're going to call it sum of amount and we'll give it a default format. This is exactly what would happen if you drag a field into the bottom right hand corner of your pivot. It's going to create an impl implicit measure. It looks like this we will create an explicit one. But what's cool about this is that you'll notice that we'll give you a count an average max min min first. If you go to min first, though, we will not give you first date. On an amount column, because that doesn't make sense. Likewise, if I were to choose something like category. I'm not going to give you a standard deviation on something that is actually built based on text. You can't sum text, average text, or standard deviation text, but you can count it. So we're smart around the way that we actually give you these options. Now, this is cool and everything else, but I'm actually not going to do this one. I'm just going to hit close because I've got a better trick here. We got this one called multiple explicit measures, what we refer to as our multi-measure monkey. There's a couple of filters here looking specifically to try and make sure that your measures get stored in the right places, i.e. not on dimension tables. So we look for linked fact tables. I'm going to go create next, and you'll notice that we've got the budgets table and the sales table. And here we go, the name for the new measures. And we've got a bit of a conflict here. The first one shown in blue, any conflict is shown in red. I'm just going to rename this. I'm going to call this measure budget dollars. There we go, no conflicts anymore. Make it a whole number and store it on budgets. This one here I'll call sales dollars. We'll make it a whole number stored on sales. I'm also going to add another aggregation. And you'll notice that we have every column as well as the name of the table. And when I click table, there's only one aggregation that can be used for that, or there's multiple that can be used for the others. This one only allows me to count rows. Well, this happens to be my transactions count. So there we go. Uh, I'm going to change the format of this. I'm going to go to a currency with no decimal or uh, with commas, but no decimals. And now I'm going to say create, and boom, there you go. All the measures have been created. It goes that fast. And now let's go create a pivot table from pivots and filters. Again, this is a standard Excel behavior. I just am too lazy to flip tabs. I mean, efficient. So I'm going to go from data model. There we go. We've brought in our stuff so I can go with my sales. I can go with my budgets. I can drop my calendar. Uh, where is my month short? We'll put that on rows. Um, I could put my categories if I want to put my class on columns. There we go. Basically, I've built myself my pivot table. So I've done all of the data modeling work, and I can actually do this very, very quickly with the tools that are in here from you know, importing tables into Excel from within the workbook, from building my calendar functions, building my measures, and away I go. Okay. So it's kind of a, a cool little uh, component there. I should probably mention this just for, I know there are people that, that love this, uh, this setup. We also have a measure table monkey as well. Um, I don't generally use measure table. I prefer to store things on my fact tables or as close as they are to the original columns. The reason being is that these give me proper folders for my information. But if you like a measure table, you can do it. You can insert your measure table monkey. What do you want to call it? There we go. One piece that's important though, you do need to take some action here and it does tell you, I'll show you what it means, is when you go into power into the data model, go to diagram view, you need to hide this column here and that will make it an official measures table. If you don't, you'll get a nice little message up the top here about how, hey, there's relationships maybe needed and stuff like that. So that's no fun, nobody wants to see it and, uh, and away we go. So, um, so the cool thing about this, is that what you just saw here, if I'm working on this and I need to build a model like this, it takes me three minutes end to end. There is no way I could go even close to that fast if I was doing all this work manually. And that's the uh, the, the beautiful thing. So um, hello, I see your comment that like that, you know, the measure monkey is like quick measures for Excel. That's exactly what it was. I mean, one of the things that that always bothered me about Power BI's model for that though, is that they never gave you the quick measure to make the basic explicit measure. They gave you quick measures for all kinds of complicated patches, which is awesome, but the basic measures weren't there. And I wish that they'd actually done that. So, um, cool. Uh, let's take a look at, hmm, let's take a look at something. Oh, you know what I'm going to do actually, let me do this. 
I'm going to take class off of this thing for a second, and I want to come into my sales here, and I want to show you where this also starts to become really useful. So I'm going to drop fiscal year onto here. You can see that my data is starting in January because that's where my data starts. It runs through my September 30th year end, and then we flip into October, and we go from October to November because that's the way things should look. And what I want to do at this point in time is I want to add myself a month to date for X months prior. Okay, so I'm trying to get one or two months back, and I happen to have in BiblioMonkey, a measure pattern for this month to date, X months prior. Notice it's all built up. It's all tagged with a whole bunch of different variables and, and whatever else. And if I now go and say inject, it comes back and says, all right, how many months prior do you want to go? So I'm going to go one month prior. Where do you want to store it? We'll put it on the measures table. Why not? What's the date column? Because I told it I want a primary key, it actually comes back and adds the calendar date there. How many months do you want to subtract? One. What's the base measure? I tagged it with sales or I tagged it with give me a measure. So it gives me the list of those. I can now say inject, exit. It has stored it on the table I told it to. And if I now go and add it to the pivot table, I'm going to get my month to date one month prior. There is my 143. Uh, this one here looks funny. The previous month, March is 182. That's because April only has 30 days where March has 31. So this is actually giving me the right value, even though it looks a little bit weird. But the nice part about this is once I've written this crazy measure pattern once, I can tag it with some smart contextual replacements. And next time I need to go and insert it, it pops up and gives me the right, the right columns right off the bat to insert it very, very easily. So it's not going to save you doing work the first time, but it is going to save you doing work the next time and the time after that and the time after that and the time after that. So that's what uh, that's what that is all about um, for working with that uh, that particular piece. Um, all right, let me just uh, check on something really quickly here. Okay, cool. So uh, a couple of things I want to take a look at um, with some of these things too. What if I want to build a measure for just beer? Okay, so I want to build my stuff where my, my category is beer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and do, this is going to be a standard uh, power pivot thing here. So let's go new measure. We're going to make ourselves a new measure called beer sales. And this is obviously going to be a calculate. Uh, we're going to go and we're taking our, our sales and, oh, come on, I hate it when that happens. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at our categories. Category equals beer. Okay, so a fairly simple measure pattern. Do not know why this is uh, um, nicely uh, ex uh, huge the way it's supposed to be, but I guess it makes it easy. So if I go and say, here we go, I'm getting a nice little uh, relationship maybe needed here. Why is that? Where did I store it? Oh, why did I put it on the categories table? That was silly. Let's put it on our measures table. That's better. Okay. So here's my beer sales. There we go. Now, I want to make another measure but I want to make this one for my wine sales or for my burger sales. So what I'm going to show you is another neat little feature here that we have, which is called Dax Sleuth. And what Dax Sleuth does is it basically pulls up a dependency tracer for your Dax measures. Here's budget, sales, transactions. Here's beer sales. Notice that this one has a little expansion. That's because we have a sales measure here. It reads from sales, so we can actually see what the dependency chain is that's actually using these things. And if I want to get a wine sales, all I need to do at this point is say wine, duplicate. I'm going to call this one wine sales. And it's going to write it in, and I now have a new wine sales measure. It inherits the same formats. It inherits the formula that we actually built. We can make the change and just hit save. You will also notice, though, that over on the right-hand side here, this is a pro feature. It tells you where this measure is being used. It's not being used at all right now. But if I go back to beer sales, you can see it's being used on sheet one, pivot table one. If I look at sales, we can see it's being used there as well. So I can actually trace these things through and select the pivot tables as well. There's a few different features in this in this thing here as well. But uh, I want to show you another, um, another thing that you've, we've got with this, which is called Query Sleuth, which works in a similar way. But this is for your queries. Okay, so you'll notice here's my budgets. Notice the plus. If I double click on it, it will show me the entire query chain that I'm using, raw data to staging to budgets. And I can step through and make light M code edits to this and update them in the workbook if I want to do so. Calendar is a bit more complicated because, of course, it comes from raw data, goes to staging, goes into the end date, which goes to calendar, and flows up this way here. You have the ability to flip this from precedence to dependence. So we can actually go the other way and say, hey, 
where is my raw data sales used? Well, it gets used in staging sales, which goes to sales. It gets used in staging sales to start date, which goes to calendar. So this allows you to actually go and chase things down to figure out what's going on. There's also a cool little function here we have for endpoints only. This actually filters out queries that are not being used. So it'll only feed things here. So if you actually see something that's yellow in this list, it's a query that can be deleted, which is kind of nice because it's not being used anywhere else. So it's kind of a cool little, uh, little feature there. Um, and what I want to do is I want to open up one more thing here, I think. Oh, no, I want to show you this first. I don't know how many people have ever done any work where they've inherited it from someone else and they're trying to figure out what's going on inside the workbook. For this reason, we also have a couple of reports under our model sleuth. The model summary report is one of the very few features in here which is not fully functional in a pro trial. Okay, what it's done is it's just gone through and it's analyzed the workbook and it's told me, hey, look at this, you got five model tables with four relationships, six measures with 162 kilobytes of what's going on in here. Five of those queries load to the data model, eight to connections, five of them are coming through Power Query. If I ever see anything in here, I go and look at the workbook because this should not be used. Okay, these are direct legacy Power Pivot connections, so these are red flags to me. We tell you about the cardinality of your relationships. We tell you about the tables. How many rows do they have? How many columns do they have? Are they disconnected? Are they snowflaked? All those stats show up inside here. Uh, here is the information about how many unique values in the data types, because, of course, these drive model compression. So these things are, are really important to know about. Um, here's all your measures. And these are actually, if you take a look at it, proper tables. You can turn the filters back on. So if you don't like the way that I indent measures, you can use DAX Studio to go and re-indent these the way that you prefer to do so. Okay, That was a, a feature request from uh, a guy, Christian Engel, who some of you may know. Uh, we explicitly list, are they explicit or implicit measures that are in here? We tell you about all your queries as well. As I mentioned, this is the one menu that provides features which are not fully functional in the pro trial. In the pro trial, we cut every other row. We feel that if you're building documentation here, you can help support our development efforts because this will save you a ton of time. In addition, we also have stuff under here like a memory usage report that will actually come back and tell you exactly how much memory usage. And you'll notice that ISO precise week is taking 33 kilobytes, which is actually like more than the stuff that I'm using and we're not using this in the model at all, right? So here's the categories. I'm not using my category class on any fields at this point in time. We have an unused uh, unused items report. It's better than unused columns. This comes back and it says, look, you built a wine sales measure. You don't actually have it used anywhere. You built a, tra a transactions measure. You don't have it used anywhere. All of these natural columns that you have inside your queries are not being used to store anything. So you have seven columns and two measures that can actually be nuked from your model. There you go. There's a little bit of documentation help along the way. I'm going to show you one more feature here, I think, um, on uh, on these things. I'm going to go and uh, let me see if I can pop into this one. I think this one should actually work nicely here. All right. So this table has this message showing up. Anybody that's worked in Excel, I'm sure you've seen this before when you're building power pivot measures. The question is why? I need to do one thing to fix this. The question is, what is it? And this is where Monkey Tools comes to help with what we call our pivot sleuth. And when you pop open the pivot sleuth, it comes back and says, there's some issues here. We say, well, what's the issue? And it says, look, we don't have a relationship and can't filter the measures table. We're gonna show you grand filter or grand totals. And it gives you a whole bunch of information here around what's going on. And if you actually mouse over this or select it, you'll notice that it says that measures a disconnected table. Your measures are probably working but they're always gonna cause this message to come up here and we'll tell you, what do you actually need to do? We think that you should probably hide this, okay? So here's the deal. If I now hop over into Excel, go to diagram view and right click and hide, this is what it says in that long piece of text, hide the unaggregated field on the table. Notice the icon changes from a table to a measures icon and the message goes away, okay? So we now have a dedicated measures table in Excel. If we look at this guy here, everything looks healthy. We've got no issues going on, but we can see that we've got some weird grand totaling going on down here. You may not be able to see this obviously, but Pivot Sleuth can. And it comes back and says, hey, hang on a second here. This is a foreign key. It might work, but we don't think that you should be using this. Likewise, budget is a facts table. You shouldn't be using fact table columns in your dimensions. It might work, but probably won't in future if things expand.
So the idea here is that sales category should actually be replaced with categories category. So here's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close this. We'll take sales category off. We'll put category category on. We shouldn't be using year from the budget table. We'll take that one off and we'll put on year from the calendar table. Now everything is actually calculating properly and Pivot Sleuth says, you got a clean bill of health. There you go. So this is to help you diagnose what's going wrong inside your pivot table engine. I'm going to show you one more feature before I go here. And I want to just make sure that you all know that this is not an exhaustive list. There are more things that I haven't been able to show you today. But because this is a Power BI user group, I think it's important to show you this kind of stuff. So I'm going to go and say new workbook. And I'm going to go to monkey tools. And I'm going to say import. And I'm going to import a BI model to Excel. This particular model here is going to be coming from a Power BI model, at which point it's going to pop open a thing here to uh, ask me to go and open my Power BI model. So let me go and uh, find my Power BI model that I want. It's going to be called LP Azure SQL. I'm going to say open. It's going to connect to this file and it's going to read a little bit of stuff. So just wait for this to happen. Hopefully it shouldn't take too long. Do, do, do. There we go. So it says, look, we've identified that one of your tables uh, was uh, generated as a calculated table. It wasn't generated by uh, by um, Power Query, so we can't import it, but we're going to try and do something a little bit differently for you here. Would you like to add error handle model protection? Highly recommend you do this and generate missing tables. Absolutely. So I just connected to a Power BI model, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this, import, and what you can see right now is that it is working through the process of stripping all of the, well, not stripping, but importing all of the queries from the Power BI desktop file, importing them into Excel, building them. It will then load the data. It will then go through and import all of the measures and create all of the relationships that it can and basically import the Power BI model back into Excel. This is the only tool on the planet that I am aware of that actually has this functionality. Granted, we cannot do everything because there are things that do exist inside Power BI that Excel doesn't have today, but we can do a lot. And, uh, and we generally come back and we'll give you a report at the end to say these are the things that couldn't be done. So you can see we're creating relationships here. Unfortunately, I can't create hidden relationships, but, uh, but there we go. We've come back and we said, look, um, we created a table for, uh, for your metrics table using Power Query. So you can see here's the metrics table, even though it wasn't done that way in Power BI. We could not hide these columns because I don't have an API to do that. So you'll need to go through and do that manually. We also can't create your sorting hierarchy. So you're going to need to do that manually. So here's the checklist of what needs to happen in order to make this work. And if you hop over into Power Pivot right now, what we can see is here is the data model that's been imported. And if I can find the table with my metrics, wherever the heck it went, there it is. This is brought over all of the measures as well. Hide from client tools, and at that point, I now have a proper measure table so that when I go to say insert pivot table against the data model, I can go in and say, let's throw our month name on here and throw our, I don't know, our sales dollars on there, and it's working. So there you go. That came from Power BI and brought back into Excel. Like I say, there are things that we can't do, obviously, if it doesn't support, if it's not supported in Excel, but we will do our best to, uh, to let you know about those things. Um, I run into this occasionally where I have built models in Power BI. That's so I need to get them back to Excel. It drives me crazy that Microsoft never gave us a way to do it. So I wrote my own. So there you go. Um, that is also a pro feature in, inside uh, inside. Um, monkey tools as well. So I'm going to wrap this one up here um, just to let you know where can you get your own monkey. Uh, you can find your own monkey at the Monkey Tools website. Um, the installer and the purchase options are here at monkeytools.ca. Uh, you can scroll down to the bottom. It is pretty big and pretty obvious where you can actually grab things from. We have a knowledge base of ever-growing articles that uh, that is going on in this. Um, it's not as up-to-date as I would like it to be, but I'm trying to keep it relatively up-to-date. Uh, if you love Monkey Tools and uh, and you decide that it's you know, not enough to just have it for yourself and you want to share the love, we do have an affiliate program where you can earn 20% and you can fill, sign up for that here. And uh, on that note, I think that's the end of my slide deck. Hello. Um, so hopefully you guys have found this interesting. If there's any questions, I am absolutely happy to entertain those as well. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you for coming. Brilliant tool. Uh, this is the first time I saw Data Monkey uh, in details. Uh, <laughs> sounds like number one external tool for Power Pivot, 
Ooh, yeah, and and, and, <laughs> and and honestly, I mean, you know, I look at the I look at the the world of what's happening inside the external tools for Power BI, and I mean, I know there's a great community behind that that's building things like you know Dax Studio and Tabular Editor and and others, Measure Killer and things like that. Um, but I don't know of too many that are actually trying to serve the Excel market. As a matter of fact, the only tool that I'm aware of that's actually out there that uh, that can be installed in Excel is Dax Studio. And like I say, I mean, my life lives, uh, the, the work that I do as an accountant leans more towards Excel. And with Power Pivot being born in Excel, Power Query being born in Excel, predating Power BI, I mean, the tools have been around for a long time. So my uh, my goal is primarily to serve that market. Um, I have thought about bringing some of this functionality into the external tools tab of Power BI, but the problem is, is that a lot of what I do is query work and Power BI unfortunately doesn't support fidelity of, in order to make any query change, you have to reload the entire model. And it's just not workable for what you need to do. So um, I think there's tools that do great jobs in their own rights. Mine is focused primarily on Excel, but again, you know, we can bring things into Excel to make things happen. And again, I'll build my models in Excel and export them to Power BI, no problem and works and this just allows me to do it rapidly and certainly allows me to get the benefits of both the structured capabilities of the data model and also the ad hoc capabilities of excel to do what i need to do which i absolutely love so so yeah it's a fun tool and uh, it is something that um i drop like i say there's one installer i mean if you uh, if you hop over to uh, to the monkey tools website uh, itself uh bang on a second where did i actually go here let me close that and try this again um so if you go to Monkey Tools, uh, there is one installer for it. We only run one. It automatically updates on a, on a regular basis. So uh, if you grab the trial or, or the pro license or whatnot, it'll walk you through the installation steps. And uh, after that, um, when you open Excel every couple of weeks by default, we will automatically check for an update and let you know if there is one. You can install it. If you prefer to have a different cadence, you can control that too, because I'm all about controlling what's actually going on on these things. Um, but there you go. It's uh, it, it's a, I mean, I hope a helpful tool. The other thing I would say, if you ever run into a scenario where, like I did, you hit bugs, we also have a log of bug form, and I encourage you to use it because I do try and respond to these things. And uh, guess what? That's what I'm going to be doing is uh, is working with that a little bit later on. Um, Aurora, is there a minimum requirement for memory? Uh, I've never had to document one of those. I mean, typically my sort of feeling is if you're working with Excel, um, you probably have sufficient memory for it. Um, if it I mean, I guess that's the question is, I mean, how much memory do you have inside your workbook? I run this on a laptop that has 16 gigs of memory, but and uh, working with Excel, that is that is more than sufficient to run things. I have another machine that has 64 gigs. It obviously runs faster, but that's as a product of the entire Excel environment running faster. So I've never, I've never had a minimum that I've had to be concerned about, but if you ever run into something that's not working, I would definitely love to hear about it because uh, that is something I probably should have documented. So. My uh, sort of philosophy is if you're on 64-bit Excel, taking advantage of more than two gigs, then you're probably just fine. So, um, yeah. So there you go. Brilliant utility to speed things up if you are using Power Pivot rather than Power BI. And look Absolutely. That it looks like the number one tool to speed Thanks. things up. Appreciate really. that. <laughs> uh, I <So>. love that. <laughs> so. There you go. Brilliant. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, listen, uh, thanks for having me, Halil. I, I really appreciate it. I love uh, love being able to show people what I'm doing on this thing here. Um, under that log of bug, there's also a request a feature. So if people do start using this and, and would like more features on this thing, by all means, shoot me a note. Um, I'm always curious to hear about it. And um, yeah, outside of that, I hope that uh, people will download it and give it a try, even on the trial version, to see if it can help and uh, hopefully stick around. So there you go. Okay, thanks a lot, Ken. I, it, it was a pleasure for me to have you again. Uh, if you give me a trial co discount code, uh, or let's say three months, then I will use that code uh, on the YouTube, <laughs> YouTube, YouTube, YouTube channel. <laughs> All right, let's, let, let's talk and we'll see what we can do. Okay, thanks a lot, Ken. Uh, is there any question? Your last chance to ask question to Ken? I see Aurora is typing right now. Yes. Aurora, please unmute yourself if you are. OK, thank you. Oh, perfect. Awesome. There you go. <laughs> um, fantastic. Excellent. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, All right. Thanks so much. We'll talk see you later, Ken. Thanks a lot. You bet. Thanks a lot. See you.